Today is um, basically orthopedics related to tennis, which I suppose is appropriate. Back pain in tennis is a funny topic because really it's the same as any other sport. The same kind of things happen in a slightly different um, frequency. As with all sports, the type of injury you get tends to relate to the type of movement that you undertake while you're performing that sport. Virtually no tennis-related back problems are surgical. They're almost all treated by rehabilitation. Uh, same for everything to do with back pain. Just because they're playing a sport, whether it be amateur or whether it be high level, um, with back problems in particular, it's difficult to get a straight answer as to what's wrong with you. It's important for the patient to have clarity. Sadly, not only is there not much evidence-based practice, there's a hell of a lot of evidence that what's done doesn't work, doesn't seem to stop us doing it. Now exercise, we tell people to exercise all the time and it's for good but also it does cause issues. Now red flags, don't apologise for this, just because they're playing sport, just because they've got back pain doesn't mean you don't consider the red flags, it's the first thing you consider when you see anybody with back pain. The red flags, think about it, I have picked up professional sportsmen with significant conditions, spinal tumours, variety of other things, transverse myelitis, for example, in a professional sportsman. So these things do get picked up. We need to. If you don't pick them up, you will regret it. Common things happen commonly, even in sportsmen. Now, this is my experience. This is just over the last two years to give you some idea of the presentation of different sports in my practice. And here we got tennis. So it's actually reasonably frequent that you see people who play tennis and have back problems. Here I'm referring to people who have back pain that is probably related in some way to their playing the sport, not just people who have back pain who happen to play tennis. So it's reasonably frequent. Um, this is the, how the pie slices up with the, the different levels of ability. This is over, I suppose it's about eight years now, so this amateur slice of the pie represents about 450 patients, all the way through to the to a professional side here, which is only eight. So very small numbers um, with significant back problems. And this is how it slices up with regard to causation. So for cetogenic pain, well, it's a sport that involves rotation and extension, both for overhead shots, for high backhand shots, a lot of rotation. So it's not surprising that the facet joints take a pounding. And I think you could safely say that Pretty much all tennis players, by the time they get to adulthood, have abnormal facet joints. So the key is obviously, is it the cause of their pain? Here I'm saying they have facetogenic pain, not they've got an MRI scan showing a dodgy facet joint. Disc issues are common in everybody, so they're common in tennis players as well. Pars issues, common in tennis, more than they would be in football or rugby, less than they would be in gymnastics or in ballet, but still, they happen. So spondylolysis, now although spondylolysis isn't the commonest cause of back pain in a tennis player, because it's an acute bony injury that does need specific treatment, it is one that should be thought of. And it's the same with any sportsman. Any sportsman with uh, an insidious onset of back pain that's persistent and activity related should be considered to have a stress fracture until you've proven otherwise, even though it's not the most likely thing that they have. The risk factors for getting a stress fracture, and this, is, this harks back to other talks, it's a combination of structure, function, and demand. How are you made, what are you doing, and how much are you asking of your spine? And it's a combination of those. Is it an orchestra where everyone's playing the instruments very well, but everyone's talking, everyone's playing different music? You know, do you coordinate your core control? Your, your, your pelvic movement, are your hamstrings working properly in combination with your lower back? So it's functional patterns of movement. And tennis is a sport, probably more than many others, where it's the functional pattern of movement that's really vital. And that's the thing that you'll all spend a lot of your time working with patients on. Um, so the risk factors for uh, spondylolysis, you've got disproportionate upper body strength with poor gluteal strength doesn't apply to professionals, really. I mean, of all the sports that I've ever had anything to do with professionally, the tennis players are, by a country mile, the fittest. Their, their level of training intensity and their general level of fitness is massive in comparison to professional footballers, whoever you like to talk about. Really, really hugely 
um, strong. But the, the vast majority of the people we see are obviously the people who play tennis at the weekends. It may be very important. You'll see somebody who plays for relaxation, but they'll play four or five times a week. So it's a significant stress on their body. So, and repeated submaximal forces. So that constant rotation and extension, rotation and extension, rotation and extension until something breaks. Um, now you can modify the workload in cricket, as, a, as it was discussed in a previous talk, if you, you restrict the number of overs that the, the, the youngsters bowl and that massively reduces the likelihood of them having a stress fracture. Um, the problem with professional tennis is, you know, they'll play four days in a week. Each game could last three or four hours. They'll train on the other days, they'll fly somewhere else and they'll do exactly the same thing and they'll play for 48 weeks a year. There aren't many sports that do that. Football certainly doesn't. You know, they'll train three times a week and play once, maybe twice, and complain if they play the second time. You know, the tennis players, their intensity is incredible. Um, but obviously amateurs, again, can overdo things. So the diagnosis. Well, you've got these things up in the air. What may they have? Well, um, facet joint pain is something you're going to think about. Spondylolysis, disc issues, red flags. As with everything else, the diagnosis is made before you scan the patient, if you're going to scan them. It's on the history, it's on the examination. Um, now, facet joint syndrome um, is a clinical diagnosis. It's, we all know what it is. You wake up in the morning, you've got a stiff, achy back. Um, you know, it takes time to be able to brush your teeth. Um, extension's uncomfortable, rotation's uncomfortable. It improves as the day goes on and gets worse towards the end of the day doesn't tend to be worse when you sit, but it's worse when you get up when you have been sitting. That sort of pain radiates into your buttocks and into the posterior thighs. Spondylolysis tends to be a more gradual onset, and you think about it in somebody who um, has a tennis stroke or a, a level of exercise that makes it more likely. Examination, uh, one-legged hyperextension, when you stand on the affected side, hyperextend and rotate, so it locks the pelvis and that can often reproduce their symptoms. Now, um, so examination's key. Investigations. Plain x-rays, don't tend to use them. Um, we'll come along to, uh, to something about imaging in tennis players in a moment, but it's radiation. If you, if you take an x-ray of somebody who plays a lot of sport, um, if they play a lot of sport, they won't have a normal x-ray. If they play a moderate amount of sport, but they've been doing it for any length of time, they won't have a normal x-ray. And they could be symptomatic or asymptomatic. So it's radiation without information. And I don't think we should be doing it. MRI scan. Um, now, we'll come on to MRI in a minute. And then we move through bone scan, spec CT, and more invasive investigations. X-rays are cheap, accessible, but they can often be misleading. MRI scan. Now, MRI scan seems great because it's quite available now, provided you can pay for it. No radiation involved. Seems like a great idea. Good paper that, um, by Ali et al. in the British Journal of Sports Medicine quite a few years ago now, looking at 33 adolescent um, elite tennis players and scanning them. And as you can see, um, only 15% of them had normal MRI scans. And these are adolescents. They're asymptomatic. So, you know, you've got PARS lesions, you've got spondylolisthesis, even up to a grade two spondylolisthesis. Two thirds of them have facet joint degeneration. And that's in an adolescent, facet joint degeneration in an adolescent, that's not normal. You scan 100 adolescents, you're not going to find facet joint degeneration in many of them at all. So, tennis obviously loads your facet joints. But what is degeneration? If you scan or you x-ray somebody and they've got an enlarged facet joint, that's not degeneration. That's the facet joint dealing with the, the load that they're putting through it. How do you spread the load? Well, you spread the force over a wider area. How do you do that? You make the joint bigger. Well, the joints are living things. So if you keep loading your facet joints at L4-5 on the right-hand side because you're a right-handed tennis player, the joints will get bigger. So that's not really an abnormality in a tennis player. It's abnormal if it's lost cartilage, if it has significant fluid in it, or if it shows up high signal on an MRI scan. So got to be careful. Uh, synovial cysts, well, I mean, you definitely say a synovial cyst is abnormal. I mean, that's, you know, so much fluid in the joint, it's formed a cyst outside the joint. But a third of them in adolescents who had no pain. So it can be really misleading.
Um, so here's just a couple of examples. Here's very intense Pearl's pedicle stress reaction showing up high signal here. Um, low signal on a T1 weighted images showed up on a bone scan. Now bone scans, bone scans, lots and lots of x-rays a bone scan, the equivalent amount of radiation, so wouldn't be your first line of investigation. Now if you've got an adolescent who plays a lot of tennis and they've got back pain and you think it could be a stress fracture and you take an MRI scan and well it could be a stress fracture and you take an x-ray and it could be a stress fracture, this is sort of a biological investigation it will show if there is significantly abnormal biology going on, if the blood supplies increase there. So that may be significant. Um, spec CT is up to 500 x-rays if you do a lumbar spine spec CT. So that's a hell of a lot to do, especially if you're talking about adolescents. So you'd only use that if you're actually going to do something about it. So the most important thing with treating these is prevent it happening in the first place. Do more of the right thing. I ask everybody, as I'm sure you do, do you play any sport, do you do any exercise? Yeah, 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 I play tennis at the weekend. Do you do any sport? You, you play tennis. Do you do any exercise? Yeah, I play tennis. No, you don't do any exercise. That doesn't count. Do you do any strength and conditioning? Do you do anything to make yourself fit enough to play? So you train to play, you don't play to train. A lot of people don't. And when you're 20 and a teenager, you don't have to do any exercise any strength and conditioning really, unless you're elite level, you can just play, you're bendy, you've got that innate muscle flexibility, so you get away with it. As you get older, you should be doing more and more strength and conditioning. Whereas what actually happens is, as people get older, they do less strength and conditioning and they rely on the sport to keep them fit, which is entirely the opposite of what they need to do. Um, take good advice, well obviously get some good coaching. If you play tennis, you are doing the same thing repetitively, so it's important to do the right do it the right way otherwise you are going to injure yourself horses for courses you know maybe you're not made to be a tennis player maybe you should be doing something else so you need to think about that just because you want to play a sport doesn't mean you can um, and the treatment of the athlete is rest if somebody has back pain that's brought on by playing tennis don't play for a bit you know it's one thing if you're getting paid 15 million pounds a year to play but if, if it's just something you do at the weekend, go and do something else. Get in a swimming pool, walk, get on a bike, allow your body to heal. It's amazing the number of people who go through all of us. They go through physio, chiro, osteopathy, they, GPs, painkillers, God knows what, and they'll come and see me, and they haven't actually stopped playing. I'm not talking about don't play for the rest of your life, just let the injury heal. Anyway, discogenic pain. Um, less common as a presentation in tennis players but as common as it is in anybody else um, treated the same way as it is in anybody else um, moving through this is facet joint degeneration on an MRI scan it's a facet joint there if you look at the normal facet joint abnormal facet joint is enlarged and irregular but again is that the cause of pain well it might be if the rest of the investigations and the rest of the examination makes you think that it is now, you also get unusual causes of pain. This is a peculiar thing. Um, this is a chap who presented with thoracic back pain, worse on rotation, which is very common in people who play sports because as people get older, obviously their thoracic spine is less mobile. And if you have back pain and you go to a therapist, they'll mobilize your thoracic spine because it's too stiff, because all else thoracic spines are too stiff. So that's how you make it better. But it isn't if you've got DISH, if you've got uh, disseminated... Um, in, uh, idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. It basically, you've got osteophytes bridging your vertebral bodies in your thoracic spine. Well, that's why it's stiff and mobilizing it isn't going to work. Um, and quite an unusual cause, but here, I mean, it's effectively developing a bamboo spine, which shows up very nicely on a SPEC CT scan because it's quite an unusual cause of pain. But you can see there, that really lights up. That's the, that's the cause of the pain. And the treatment for that is rest. You're not going to go in and excise that osteophyte through their chest. It's just to rest. Um, facetogenic pain. Probably the most common. How do you manage facetogenic pain in, in, in a tennis player? Well, obviously you rest. You make sure they're playing properly. You make sure their core work is working properly. You make sure they're flexible enough. You build up through functional rehabilitation.
functional movements, moving more than one joint, more than one part of the body at a time, working on rotation, all very important. If that doesn't work, then we can move on to more invasive treatments. Tennis player, not professional tennis player, amateur tennis player with low back pain. No other symptoms and an enormous disc prolapse, huge, with cauda equina compression, but no other signs or symptoms whatsoever. So these things can happen to anybody, and that's the, that's the disc fragment that's taken out, that's five centimetres, that's enormous. Um, so treatment, pain relief, you work through the normal things. This is just referring to the treatment of spondylolysis. I'm not going to go into it in detail. Um, but basically it's rest, rehabilitate, analgesia, and operate only if you have no choice. So you stop exercising. Um, once the pain's settled, you progressively rehabilitate and you use your rehabilitation time carefully. Epidural steroid injections are not a magic cure, they just make the patients feel better to enable them to rehabilitate properly, so they're worthwhile. Facet joint injections, exactly the same. Radiofrequency nerve ablation can be quite useful and keep people going. If you have somebody whose job involves them playing tennis, for example, then buzzing the facet joints and keeping it pain-free may be what needs to be done, and it may need to be done frequently. Coblation, again, this is, you see, when professional sportsmen have issues, nobody wants to operate on them, and I certainly don't want to operate on them, so you try anything short of surgery, and coblation is one of the things that people try, and it's basically trying to cook the disc from the inside to get it to shrivel up if you've got a disc prolapse. Seems like a good idea, but it doesn't work. This is what I'm talking about, the, the kind of functional movements, rotation movements. What are you going to do when you play sports? So let's rehabilitate you doing the things that you're actually going to need to do. Um, you know, doing the plank and the sort of Superman and more sort of classical Pilates type movements is great, but it's really not going to help you when you get back on a tennis court. You need to have those movement patterns ingrained whilst you're moving and you haven't got the time to think about the way that you're moving. So um, that's the way forward. And the return to play is you use your time wisely. Am I playing correctly? Get some coaching. Look at your orthotics. How do you move? Um, maybe get a running coach. It's amazing. People play tennis, and it actually involves a lot of sprinting. And nobody's ever looked at the way that they sprint. You know, going for a jog for 10 miles isn't going to help you running around a tennis court. So that's one thing to do. Um, further radiology, don't only investigate people really if um, they're not settling. Surgery, last resort, absolute last resort. I know I'm putting myself out of business, but the, you know, uh, people who play sport to a decent level need to avoid surgery unless they haven't got a choice. Um, the thresholds obviously change depending on how important it is for them to get back to their sport as quickly as possible, but you'd still try and put people off. Repairing spondylolysis is um, not a great thing to do. Uh, often the, the repairs fail, the screws break, and you end up with more pain than you started off with. And it takes, after a spondylolysis repair, up to a year before you can re return to sport. If you hadn't played sport for a year, you'd have returned to sport anyway, so um, I wouldn't advise it. Pain is normal in elite athletes. All elite athletes deal with pain all the time. It's how they manage it and whether it's outside of that envelope of normality for them. The vast majority of people need conservative management. Diagnosis is mostly clinical. Imaging is often misleading, but can still be useful. Um, do little to them. We're all supposed to be helping people recover themselves. Remember that the function, what they're aiming to get back to and what their, their aspirations are. And sometimes it involves telling them, you can't do that, you need to do less or have a, a lower target. Often, you know, someone needs to have a conversation and say, look, you, you know, if you're gonna play tennis six times a week, you're gonna end up playing nothing. So pace yourself, mix your sport up, do more than one thing and that'll be the best thing for you. And rehab is king. Thank you. My name is Callum Clark and I am an orthopaedic foot and ankle surgeon and uh, my main practice is in Windsor, just west of here, but I've been coming to the Fortress Clinic for about a year now. And I'm going to talk about this, um, to, about the ankle. Probably the, the nearest thing to uh, tennis <coughs> ankle is, is the inversion injury. Um, 
And really, if you look at the types of injuries that you would get in tennis, or the types of injuries I would see, they'd probably be divided into acute and chronic. Um, and certainly, by far and away, the most common acute injury is an inversion. Um, and you'll all, you all recognise that. And obviously, it's the most common injury in the musculoskeletal system, full stop. Counts for probably 20 to 25% of all MSK injuries. We do also see in, in the non-elite population, in fact, the non-competitive population, really, um, ruptured Achilles tendons. And, and this is quite common in sports which call upon sudden explosive um, actions, such as tennis or, or squash or badminton. Um, and in the chronic ones, well, there are chronic ankle problems, possibly as a result of recurrent inversion sprains. Um, and then Achilles tendon problems, which, of course, you'll also see very frequently too. And I think in the, in the professional, or, or certainly the competitive versus the non-competitive would probably be better than professional versus amateur, you tend to see more uh, acute injuries in, in competitive players um, and certainly fewer ruptured Achilles tendons. So this is an interesting uh, paper, relatively recent. Uh, data from 15 years of the US Open tennis looking at the, um, the, the injuries encountered. And what you find is that lower limb injuries outnumber um, upper limbs, certainly in acute injuries. And that the ankle is, is the most common acute tennis injury. And of course, most of these are, um, are inversion sprains. So we're going to concentrate on this, the, the inversion injury, which is uh, uh, so, so common in tennis. And to look at that, we need to look at the causes. And, and, and also understand the stability of the ankle. So, like any joint, you've got the static and the dynamic stabilizers. And in the ankle, we've got the ankle mortis, which is a very good bony uh, stabilizing factor. And we've got the ligamentous um, static stabilizers, and of course, the perineal musculotendinous unit as the dynamic stabilizer. This is, the, this is the talus. It's important to understand the shape of the talus if you're going to understand ankle inversion injuries. Who knows what a frustum is? This is for a gold star. It's a mathematical term and it's a truncated cone. So if you imagine a cone with the top chopped off, that's, that's the, the basic shape of the talus. So the narrow bit, the top bit, is on the medial side and the wide bit's on the lateral side. Okay? If you imagine how a frustum moves, that gives you an idea that the foot will not move in it, in it. It's, not, it's not a pure hinge, it will go one way and then the other. In fact, it's up and out and down and in, okay, because of the frustum shape of the, of the talus. We've also got this funny um, axis of motion in the ankle, which runs roughly between the tips of the malleoli, which also adds to the, it's, part, it's partly a function of the frustum shape, but also means that when you dorsiflex, you'll go out, and when you plantiflex, you'll go in, okay? The syndesmosis is always, I'm not going to talk much about the syndesmosis because it's not really um, a common injury in, in tennis. To injure your syndesmosis, you would normally um, have a dorsiflexion external rotation motion. So it's this kind of thing, okay, which is not as common in tennis. We're talking about this thing. Um, but the syndesmosis, the, the fibula moves up um, by about two, two millimetres in ankle dorsiflexion and externally rotates as well and opens up um, uh, anteriorly, it's the external rotation. So even that part of the joint is not static. And then if we look at the ligamentous stabilizer in a bit more detail, we've got the ATFL, of course, which you'll all know, which is the most commonly injured because it's the weakest. So it's a broad, thin ligament, really just a condensation of the ankle capsule. Then you've got the CFL, the calcaneofibular ligament, which is less commonly injured, uh, but very important clinically. So it's a, it's a little tube when you look at it when you're operating as opposed to the broad, flat, sort of centimetre wide ATFL, the CFL is a, literally like a little tube. And the PTFL is so strong that it is very rarely injured and would more likely pull off an avulsion fracture than actually rupture itself. So that's the, the static stabilisers. Then we come on to the dynamic stabilisers. This thing about perineal reaction time, it may be oversimplistic. So there was a very recent meta-analysis which showed that um, if you look at um, patients who have had previous ankle inversion injuries, they have a delayed perineal reaction time. That would seem obvious to you, I guess. Um, and that's obviously slower than the contralateral limb or healthy control. So looking at all of the papers that have been done on this, that seems to be the sort of consensus of opinion.
But what about, there are lots of other things as well that are factors here. Um, strength, postural stability, and so on. And we're, we're interested in, as surgeons, in the, this subtle cavus foot thing. So the, the, the posture or the, or the version of the heel, whether it's in slight varus or not. Very, very important factor. And then there are these various studies on perineal neuromuscular control. Um, they're all uh, more or less the same type, kind of study. You'll get a subject walking along, a healthy volunteer, usually, usually a medical student, and they'll walk along and then all of a sudden the trap door on the floor will give way and they'll go over and they'll be connected to um, sensory equipment and then the, 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 the studiers will be looking at what happens to uh, the motion in the ankle and what happens to the perineal muscles. Lots and lots of studies done like this. Um, and what we know is that the perineal muscles um, react too slowly to actually stop the inversion injury happening. So by the time um, the event has happened, um, the perineal muscles haven't even started contracting. Okay, so what they actually do is they help avoid having the, the foot in the position at risk. So if your perineal muscles are walking normally, when you swing through, you're not likely to catch the front of your foot and invert your, injury, your, your ankle. However, if you do, your perineal muscles are still not going to be, be able to react quickly enough to stop it from happening. Okay? So they're important, but not for the reason of stopping the injury from happening. They're important for preventing it from happening in the first place. What, what we do understand is, is better um, gleaned from looking at videos of real inversion injuries. And funnily enough, tennis is the richest source of this kind of data because we have lots of inversion injuries happening on camera. Um, and what, what uh, this very recent study showed was that it's the position of the foot at landing that's the most important determinant of whether there will be an inversion sprain. So if the foot, it sounds you know, intuitively obvious, but if the foot is slightly internally rotated when the, when the, when the player starts to slide or land from their slight jump, then they are more likely to go over and invert their angle than if it was planted straight. So actually, if all we have to do is go and tell our patients to you know, put their foot straight when they're sliding for to, to retrieve a drop shot, then you will have done them some good. So here's a few videos. Look at the right foot here. Internally rotated, boom. Okay. Same thing in common, all of these. Look at the right foot on all these. I've got three of these. Because I just want to wake you up, really. You know. Right foot again. Slightly inverted, okay? So these are just ligament injuries. These are not fractures. These are just lateral ligament sprains. And again, right foot in a horrible position and goes over. Okay, so it's the position of the foot as these players land or slide that puts them in trouble. So, first line treatment. Um, it's a really common injury, as I said. It's as common as one ankle inversion per 10,000 people per day. So in England, that's about 5,000 a day are happening. And of course, most of them don't even get to see you, and very, even few of them get to see us, because most of them resolve very quickly. And the stat is probably that 95% of these resolve in about six weeks. Okay. It's very difficult to come up with accurate stats, but this was a consensus from a, a statement from an <coughs> organisation called ISACOS, with a sort of organisation of leading um, sports surgeons from around the world. So that's the sort of worldwide consensus of what we can quote to patients. And the disability, this is a ridiculous figure, at a year you can, you can either be 10 or 76% likely to have a disability after an ankle inversion sprain or anywhere in between. So that means nothing. And, and we don't really know. We don't really know. Is there evidence for acute repair? Well, it's um, controversial. Um, one of the members of the Fortius group, James Calder, is, uh, has published on this. And um, it's only really indicated in elite athletes. And surprisingly, there isn't a huge amount of difference in return to play between acute repair and conservative or functional treatment. So there's not an enormous difference. So. Um, what we do is a home exercise program. I mean, most of us would feel that um, unsupervised program is not as good as a supervised program, and certainly with the current audience, I would say that. And um, I think because of, if nothing else, because of compliance, because patients aren't as likely to comply with an unsupervised program. Um, but it works. You know, there's a there's a definite risk uh, reduction in the risk of um, re-injury. 
So the, the evidence for a functional rehab of some sort is, is pretty much overwhelming. Taping. This is controversial. Um, we all know that taping stretches out fairly quickly. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if you recognize the, the high instance of skin problems. I think they're all very minor skin problems. Um, but there have been some studies that have shown that it prevents re-injury, probably in the, in the very acute stages. I don't know how you all have your own opinions on that. Bracing, however, the evidence is pretty good. Uh, this was an interesting randomized controlled trial um, and showed that um, there, were, there were three groups. They either had neuromuscular or proprioceptive training for eight weeks, or they had bracing for a year with no proprioceptive training, or they had both, but only with the bracing for eight weeks. And the best group was the bracing for a year. And I would probably say that all that tells us is that proprioceptive training and a longer period of bracing is, is, is beneficial rather than just eight weeks. And what about the other 5% who don't recover? So these are the ones that may end up coming our way. And uh, we, you've got to think of associated injuries. Why are they in a 5%? Why haven't they recovered? So obviously there could be a fracture. Um, but other common things we see are perineal tendon injuries, um, chondral lesions, so articular cartilage damage, uh, which may or may not involve some underlying bone as well. And then we, we sometimes see some longer term sequelae as well, and impingement will be the most common. Instability would be when the patient has recurrent inversion injuries, and occasionally you'll see a patient who's been going over on their ankle so many times over many years, they'll actually present with osteoarthritis. This is a perineal tendon subluxation, so here's the heel, the toes are down here. There's a great big pocket which has been lifted up on the outside of the fibula where this perineal tendon just flops in and out of. Okay, and of course that can lead to splitting and fissuring of the tendon over time. On the right hand side there's an arthroscopic picture of um, an osteochondral lesion, a big flap of cartilage I'm lifting, lifting up with my probe there. So, ankle instability. Um, I just want to emphasize these, these, um, these points because they're very important. Beware when you're taking a history from a patient and they say, my ankle gives way, because it doesn't always mean I am suffering recurrent inversion injuries. Often, the patient uses it to mean there's a sudden sharp pain, don't they? I, you, I don't know if you recognize that, but they'll take a step and all of a sudden they've got to take their weight off the ankle. Now, that, that doesn't immediately, to me, say that their, their lateral ligaments are lax and they're rolling over. It means there's something going on in the ankle, but giving way to patients doesn't always mean what I understand as giving way. What's the difference between laxity and instability? So one, one is an examination finding, so the ligament is actually loose, and one is a symptom. The patient says, my ankle's unstable. Okay? So it's important because only by understanding that can you understand the difference between functional and mechanical instability. So functional instability is when the patient is complaining of the ankle giving way, but the ligaments are not lax. Okay, we call that functional instability. So there can be a number of causes of that. The most common one is, is perineal muscle, uh, poor neuromuscular control. Mechanical instability is when the patient's ankle is giving way and the ligaments are lax. Okay, so that's where we're really interested because there's, a, there's loose pieces of rope that we can potentially tighten up. And when you examine a patient, it, uh, the, so here A is the CFL and B is the ATFL. When you do perform your, your draw and your tilt test, just bear in mind that um, you need to be pulling forwards with the foot slightly plantar flex to test the ATFL. And you need to dorsiflex the foot and tilt the heel into varus to test the CFL. Okay, if, you if you try and tilt the heel into varus when, when the foot is plantar flex, you'll be testing both really, only by orientating that that A ligament on the far right in a sort of fairly vertical position will you be purely testing CFL. Difficult to do. There's, a, there's an anterior draw on the left and a varus tilt on the right. An anterior draw is the, best, the, the, the better of the two. It's more sensitive and specific. So if the patient has failed um, neuromuscular rehab, then they may need an operation. And these are all fairly old-fashioned operations now. If you'd had an operation for ankle instability Several years ago, you would have had a bit of perineus brevis rerouted in some way or other through holes in the fibula. And the trouble with these operations is that they weren't particularly isometric. We, we have more isometric equivalents of those operations now. But they're big incisions, big exposures. Um, sometimes we may take a tendon from someone else, somewhere else like a hamstring and do this. But um, 
they, they tend to over stiffen the joint. And we know from long term studies that um, only about 50% are satisfactory, and there's an, even an instance of osteoarthritis um, late on because of the over stiffening of the joint. So, this is the operation that we all love now. Have you all hold of this, heard of this Brostrom operation? Yeah. So, it's pretty much um, the operation we do now. It's the operation of choice. It's basically a delayed primary repair. We just go in and we find out find what's left, and there's always something left, or almost always. And you can either uh, attach it to the fibula through drill holes, or more commonly via uh, a little suture anchor widget with a little little screw with sutures coming out of it. And you can hoik the the ATFL and the CFL back on the bone and tighten it up. And we always, or almost always, combine this with an arthroscopy. And the reason is. Here's a recent paper, there have been, there have been several like this. Uh, there is a high incidence of um, concurrent pathology when you perform a, an arthroscopy at the time of a brostrum. And the most common th thing is a, a bit of synovitis or impingement. And we can deal with that at the time via an arthroscopy. The other thing is, being just a primary repair, the brostrum procedure is not as strong as the other uh, repairs, which is an advantage in the sense it doesn't over tighten the joint. But a disadvantage, you know, I mentioned the, the varus heel scenario before. If you perform a brostrum on a patient with a varus heel, so with someone who's slightly this way inclined, it won't be strong enough, it will fail. Okay, so we have to combine that with a, a heel shift osteotomy. We'll cut the heel, we'll shift it laterally at the same time as the brostrum and realign their biomechanics. Rehab after brostrum is, is fairly quick. It's a day case operation. They have to look after their wounds, so they're non-weight bearing in a splint. Um, and elevating their foot at home for 10 days, pretty standard for a foot operation. Uh, but after that, once the wound's healed, they can get, get weight bearing um, in something like an air sport brace. And um, I generally hold off physio until about six weeks, and then they can start a proper ankle rehab program, and you're looking for a return to training three or four months. And the outcomes from this operation are really good, much better than the old operations. So we're looking at you know, high, high levels of return to sport. More recent variations, arthroscopic brostrum. There's several little techniques are being tried. Um, I've tried this on dead German's ankles and didn't like it. Um, thermal capsular shrinkage. Um, again, it's something that's been tried in the shoulder and various other joints in the body. There may be some promise. I, personally, I think it's um, unlikely to be the answer. And then just, just to finish with, um, we'll come right round to bracing again because a very recent modification is this idea of doing a brostrum and then putting a little carbon fibre brace on top of your brostrum reconstruction, thus the internal brace, which will prevent your brostrum from stretching out in time. So it's slightly looser than the brostrum, but it's just there as a little check rein. And uh, the idea being that you can rehab athletes more quickly. I've used it, I've done about half a dozen, and for me it's more useful in patients with hypermobility syndrome uh, and the occasional revision case where there's some, still some tissue left. But there may, be, there may be some use for this in the future. I think that's quite a decent technique. That's it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Alice Bremner-Smith. I'm a consultant hand and wrist surgeon based at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. And uh, I treat all aspects of hand and wrist uh, pathology including traumatic injuries and elective conditions. I'm going to talk about um, the wrist in tennis players, um, particularly in higher level tennis players. Um, and it's, it is quite a significant problem in tennis and it accounts for about 11% of significant injuries in men and about 16% in women. You do get general um, injuries, falls, etc. but most of the problems occur from the chronic use, as we were saying, the, the players play a great deal and most of the pain is on the ulnar side of the wrist and ECU problems are by far the biggest problem. So I'm actually going to focus, this talk is primarily going to be focused on that. And there are some precipitant factors um, that have been identified, pri primarily players that use a, a, a big range of motion run into more problems. Um, interestingly, the elite players, um, a lot of them, um, some of them can play with a restricted range of mo motion um, very well and it tends to be the more um, less experienced players that use the, the bigger range of motion. 
Um, and other factors count, like the time when they hit the ball. If you hit the ball late, you get a, a higher loading impact. So there can be modifications made to the way people play. Obviously, these days, um, tennis is um, a lot of uh, talk about topspin. It's become a, a big issue, and it causes uh, quite a lot of issues with people's wrists, especially the double-handed backhand, which um, is responsible for a lot of problems. It can be in either hand. And, for example, in, in this player, you can see it's in a, this is a very vulnerable position for the wrist. It's flexed, it's ulnar-deviated, and it's in full pronation, and he's about to whip it round into supination and it puts a lot of stress on the ulna side. String tension tends to be high to get a powerful return. Grip styles um, have vary. This is a, a western style where they use a fully supinated wrist and then they whip it round again into full pronation to get the top spin. That's associated with more problems and often the wrist is in ulna deviation when it hits the ball so it, it's got a high stress on that ulna side. There are various things on the ulna side of the wrist that can cause trouble, um, as well as ECU. There's the TFCC, there's the lunotriquetral ligament, there's the piezotriquetral ligament, which has actually been chopped off in this uh, section. Um, and you can get fractures and other injuries, but I'm not really going to focus on those because they're actually rarer. It's, it's primarily um, ECU that we're looking at. And there are various things that can happen to it. Um, you can get a synovitis, you can have a tendinopathy, you can get instability and you can get rupture or you can get a combination of these and again you can see for example here this is this is ECU here uh, you can see how much stress it's put under and why it starts to um, suffer so ECU is a long muscle located on the ulnar aspect of the forearm it arises in the lateral epicondyle and inserts down here into the base of the fifth metacarpal um, and its action varies depending on the position of the forearm. Uh, one of the key things about it is after it leaves the forearm, it goes through a fibro-osseous tunnel here, um, which is uh, basically based in a bony groove on the back of the ulna. Um, the roof is made by the retinaculum, which stops it bowstringing, but the, underneath that there's a sub-sheath which attaches it to the ulna. And that's the most important stabilising factor. And this sheath means the ECU moves less freely, it's, it's fixed compared to the other tendons and so it comes under a lot more stress in pronation and supination. It varies its action in pronation, it's slightly volar, it's situated away from EDM and it doesn't contribute a lot to extension. In supination it moves dorsally and closer to EDM and then it runs through a 30 degree angle at the wrist before it inserts and that's when it's under the greatest tension and that's when most of the problems seem to occur. So initially the, 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 the usual early sign of a problem is uh, tendonitis or tenosynovitis and we all know what that is, it's an inflammation usually in the sheath primarily with increased fluid and examination can be fairly vague, it's normally just a pain on the ulna side of the wrist, you can get a bit of tenderness to palpation um, classically resisted extension in ulnar deviation will reproduce that pain. Moving on from tendonitis, you tend, sort of moving a step forward, you can start to get tendinopathy. And this is slightly different. This is where the tendon starts to fail to adapt to the stresses that are being put on it. And you can start to get actual um, dis dis disintegration within the, the tendon collagen tissues. And it's described as going through certain stages, although it's basically a gradual spectrum. And it can start as a reactive tendinopathy, where the tendon is basically intact, minimal change, but it slightly thickens and it's slightly stiffer. Moving on to disrepair, where the structure starts to break down and you can get increased vascularity. And finally, a degenerative tendinopathy. Um, which is commoner in older athletes, where the collagen becomes more disorganized, the matrix starts to fall into disarray, and you can start to get partial tears and splitting in the tendon. The symptoms of tendinopathy are similar to tendonitis, basically. The, the story is a gradual onset of pain, typically, um, on the ulna side of the wrist, sometimes a dull ache with a, a much worse pain on certain movements. Often 
tennis players can continue to play tennis with these symptoms. It, it often hurts primarily when they do the first strokes in the warm-up and then they find they can adapt to it and, and start playing. Clinically, you can get a slight swelling of the sheath and some pain on palpation. And there is a test for tendinosis, which is if you take the patient's arm and put them in 90 degrees at the elbow, supinate and extend the fingers, then you, you palpate the thumb and put your other end of your hand, side of your hand, obviously it'd be the other way around in a patient, on the ECU and, and adduct the thumb then the ECU contracts um, and if, you, if, you, if that's associated with pain that's supposed to be pathognomonic for ECU tendinosis. Another problem that's, that's particularly relevant for tennis players is instability of ECU and there's a massive spectrum. It can <coughs> range from a very minor instability to frank dislocation and it results from rupture or disruption of the sheath typically starts with an acute traumatic event, but rarely can be just produced by repetitive use. And it's particularly vulnerable, as I said, in the double-handed backhand. And what's quite interesting, if you look at these two players, so this is Djokovic up here, who does a double-handed backhand, and <coughs> this wrist, again, is ulnar-deviated, flexed, and about to go pronation into supination. Whereas Federer, um, if you watch him play, has got a fantastic wrist position. It's almost in neutral when it hits the ball, and it's very strong. He, he's got a, a really good technique for longevity. The an actual anatomy of the ECU instability, I'm not going to go into in great detail, but basically, as I say, it's, there's, there's two components. There's the retinaculum that goes over the top. That can disrupt, and the tendon can completely come out but more commonly there's a subsheath underneath that, that ruptures and basically it can rupture on the ulna side or the radial side or it can detach and take the periosteum out of the distal ulna. The symptoms of this, there's usually an acute episode which is described as a pop or a snap or a sudden pain and the player has to stop playing. Sometimes only for a few minutes, sometimes for a few days and then sometimes they find they can resume playing but with a slightly different stroke, usually putting on less top spin and using a flatter stroke action. Also described as a rebound pain, when they've hit they get pain in, around the ulnar styloid. That's another um, su uh, symptom that's described. The odd thing about instability is some people can have apparent instability which is actually painless and, and in asymptomatic. So it's, the, the difficulty sometimes is differentiating between those two. So with instability, it can sometimes be painful, sometimes not so. You can see the subluxing snap of the tendon as ECU contracts in certain positions of the wrist. And again, if you, one of the ways to do this is to hold the wrist in this, this position, ulnar deviation and flexion, and then get the patient to try and supinate against you and that will usually cause it to pop out if it's going to be unstable. Often the signs are more su subtle and again you get tenderness, some swelling on the dorsal ulnar aspect of the wrist. And before going on to imaging there's another condition that can happen which is actual rupture of ECU. This is not common, this is rare and may follow a tendinopathy Interestingly, in the cases that are described, it is rare um, and it can follow that there isn't a possible association with steroid injections in uh, tendinopathic um, ECU. Classically, the players say they, can't, they, they, can, they can do normal daily activities fine with a ruptured ECU, but they can't do their power stroke, they can't do their double-handed backhand. So imaging is important to differentiate between uh, the different conditions and ultrasound is probably the most useful imaging modality. And the great thing about ultrasound is it's quick, you can visualise inflammation at the same time, you can compare the other side and you can do dynamic testing for instability and actually see what's happening. And also you can ask the radiologist to inject steroid at the same time if that's helpful. And what you might see in tendonitis, you tend to see increased fluid in the sheath that's compressible and the tendon may look normal 
With tendinopathy, you may see thickening initially and then low echo areas as the tendon substance starts to degenerate and sometimes then clefts or splits further on. And if, it, if, if it's ruptured, then you've got an empty sheath. Um, initially, you may get a hematoma and later on you get atrophy of the muscle as well. For instability, the ultrasound can be tested in the same way as the clinical exam and you can sometimes see that instability with ultrasound. But as I say, it's important to differentiate from a normal degree of instability and it's generally considered if it comes out more than 50% and particularly if it fails to go back into the groove when you pronate, then that's probably symptomatic and significant instability. MRI is a helpful adjunct to ultrasound and um, one of the useful things about MRI with instability is you may be able to locate the, the site and the area on the subsheath where the instability has occurred and you can actually also um, use it for monitoring recovery in that way. So I think ultrasound is, is the most useful but MRI has a, has a role as well. So treatment for these, well tenosynovitis or tendonitis, most of us know, can be treated with rest, it can be treated with anti-inflammatories, splintage and maybe some guided injections if required. Tendinopathy is similar, um, activity modification, modifying technique which applies to all of these conditions and again rest, splintage, some advocate long arm casts with in pronation. Um, there are different modalities of splintage depending on the severity of the case and how recalcitrant it is. Um, it's thought anti-inflammatories may be helpful. In the early stages it may be reversible by this process but later on less likely to be reversible. And ultimately there is little uh, more that can be done other than considering a guided steroid injection but obviously being wary if you have a tendinopathy of the status of the tendon and the, being wary about the, the risk of causing a rupture. Um, you can inject local anaesthetic first to dilate the sheath which can be helpful diagnostically and also allow placement of the steroid. Um, the other option is to surgically decompress the compartment by going between the fifth and sixth compartments so that you, you need to maintain the stability of the ECU whilst giving it more room um, so that it's um, not so stressed on, on movement. And for ECU instability, there's a range of treatments. If, if you have an early acute injury, this can be treated non-operatively. It doesn't need to be surgically reconstructed and most cases aren't. And it can be treated for a variable amount of time depending on how well it heals. The, if you look at the, 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 the literature cases that are described, it, it may be up to four months, which is a long time for elite athletes to, to be out of play. So often what you can do is take it out each month, image it and stress it and see if it's healing. And as soon as it appears to be returning to stability, then obviously you can take things a step forward. You can surgically reconstruct these and you can either do it it's described as non-anatomically using a little bit of ECU which this little picture is just sort of demonstrating here you literally just use ECU to form a new sort of sheath around it or you can anatomically reattach it if the sub sheath has come away to the distal ulna and for ECU rupture obviously you, you can't repair a ruptured tendon um, but you can use another tendon for example palmaris longus to reconstruct that, but that's a longer procedure. Um, but in, if, if players want to get back to high level tennis, it is um, felt to be very significant if that tendon is ruptured as regards their level of play, so they may wish to pursue that. I haven't gone into tennis elbow because I felt that's elbow, not wrist, so that's a talk for another time. Um, and But just, I've talked a lot about ECU, but there are other, actually de Quervain's tendonitis is probably the commonest tendonitis in, in, in general tennis players in the wrist rather than elite players. Um, FCU tendonitis is also very common on the ulm side and they're all treated in much the same manner as, uh, as the ECU conditions but not associated with instability. Thank you.